I'm Bear McCreary, composer for Battlestar Galactica. By now all of you have seen behind the scenes footage of composers and conductors working with orchestras to record music for film or television. In fact, there's many other steps to this process that take place both before and after the recording session, especially on a show like Battlestar. In order to show you the amount of work that goes into every piece of music on this show, we're going to show you the evolution of a single cue from beginning to end. My score for this series has evolved and grown so much over the past four years, it makes it difficult to claim that there's such a thing as the typical Battlestar Galactica cue. But if there were, a good example of it would be in episode 414, A Disquiet Follows My Soul. In this episode that was actually written and directed by series executive producer Ron Moore, there's a montage where Laura is jogging through the hallways. And the score to this sequence is actually a great example of the kind of cue that I write in every episode of the show. The first musical ideas for any scene begin with the picture editor when he lays in what's called the temp score. The editor has taken a stab at uh, placing music cues throughout the show that he thinks are appropriate for it. And um, it's a decision that the editor and assistant editor make between them or the editor ultimately makes. And um, it really is perfect to kind of start to rough out kind of a blueprint for the show. Just to get a rhythm and you know, like a, a, almost a tone uh, so that then uh, Bear would know uh, what the producers were thinking tone-wise. And now that we're in season four of the show, we have many hours of bearish music to draw from. After the temp score is complete and the picture is locked, well, mostly locked, I come in for what's called a spotting session. And this is the first chance that the producers and the editors and I have to sit down and discuss their ideas for the music of the episode in detail. And it's usually the first time that I've ever seen the episode. It essentially creates um, a dialogue between Bear and myself and the picture editor about um, what type of music should ultimately be in the show, uh, where it starts, uh, where it ends, each cue, uh, what it expresses, is it commenting on the subtext of the scene, is it merely uh, uh, suspenseful or an action cue or something to highlight an action piece in the show. And so, um, it's an open dialogue that lasts for about two hours for a 42 minute viewing as we just kind of talk about ideas. The way the temp was here, it, it started getting big on the shots of her like when she's getting exhilarated. Well, that's what I was to say, that's what he wants to, and you'll see it on her face too, and he tried to play this, her, she starts getting more exhilarated and actually feeling better, and she's running faster. Yeah, this is the previous cue. Yeah. That's why he wanted the music to get, you know, pump up as she gets so more are we So are we saying, are we saying that this is giving her a second life? This yeah, you're, you're, this is about a... to have a long exchange here about Dama trying to say, listen, it, the doctor says it's a temporary release of the toxicity in your system that is, you, you yeah. think you feel good, but you're really still sick, now, and her being in denial about that. The temp score was cut from two pieces from the season two soundtrack album, One Year Later and Worthy of Survival. Now these are two pieces that don't necessarily fit together musically, but I could tell from where they placed them that Mikey and Ron knew exactly what they wanted the music to accomplish in the scene. We had tried a few others first, and uh, uh, Ron wasn't too happy with them, and then we threw that one in, and instantly he reacted. He was like, yes, that's it, that's it. And he was real excited about it, I remember. They knew they wanted an energetic, but still mysterious beginning, a higher energy and darker middle section, and then a shift when we cut to Laura and see this elation on her face, this energy that's coming to her. So she starts to, she's getting more energized, yeah. and uh, you can see on her face, and um, uh, she's getting more like yeah. Ron usually gives all his music notes during the editing process, but in this particular spotting session, he stopped by and discussed this scene with us. Ron, the tone of this, though, this music, you like, right? We'll have to change it when you're saying it's so distinct. It makes me think of the, the time jump in season two, but I love what it's doing. Yeah, I like the yeah, I like the, the flow of it and the rhythm of it. And there's this yeah. undercurrent of something yeah. sad or terrible or something sort of pushing us along. Yeah. That even compared to it has an American beauty. School yeah, it has. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It has that sort of American beauty quality too. Cool. Well, I can definitely preserve all preserve all that. So typically, after we've done the spotting session and I have met with the producers and we've discussed it, then I come back to my studio and now it's time to assimilate all the ideas that have come up into one piece of music and I find myself uh, at the piano and there's no outside influences anymore and I just get to create. And um, for me, the most important aspect of any scene is, is what is the theme going to be? Um, there are a ton of character themes that I've written for this show um, and uh, one, of the, one of the most lovely is this theme that I wrote for uh, 
uh, Rosalind and Adama, which is this sort of waltz. There's something about it that represents their character. So my next decision is to figure out how to set it. So back in the old days of TV and film scoring, composers would work primarily with pencil and paper. And that doesn't happen so much anymore, and especially on Battlestar Galactica's timetable, I have no chance to work that way. So I write on the computer, and one of the ways that I write is um, I play the keyboard and I trigger uh, a vast collection of samples that I have on my various computers. So for example, I have um, my custom drum sounds that I've created for this show. And that's a, one of the ways that I will get an idea for drum riffs is by playing stuff basically on the piano that are then going to get played on the drums. So the first thing I usually do is pick a, a simple sound that I can work with, uh, either a piano or, or in this case, um, some strings, so that I can just kind of experiment. And I think I just started playing around with, um, with the Rosalind and Adama theme. in different modes, different settings. And then eventually I kind of stumbled across um, I stumbled across this little motive. There was something interesting about this. It's a repeating minor third figure that is obviously reminiscent of the tenth. But it also is something that I could set underneath Rosalind and Adama's theme in an interesting way. The next thing I did was flush that out into a more complete string orchestration. So you can hear on the top line, you have the Rosalind and Adama theme. And then in the bottom line, the strings are moving in a counter line. This is what I programmed here. You've got the top melody line, this counter line set underneath it. Once we get this to the live string ensemble, these fake string patches get taken out so that you don't hear them. All you hear are the real strings, which of course sound much better. Now obviously that doesn't really sound very Battlestar Galactica-esque. Um, it just sounds orchestral, and there's a lot of other elements that make the Battlestar score unique. The first thing I added was a gamelan ensemble, and that's this group of instruments here. It's got a very um, interesting detuned quality, detuned bells and bowls and all kinds of strange sounds that give it an otherworldly quality. Of course, no Battlestar Galactica piece would be complete without a hefty dosage of percussion. One of the things that I did is I used the percussion as a way to help the track crescendo and build an energy, and that's the big climax right there. You can hear all the drums are going, all the gamelons are going, uh, all the small perk is going, the strings are going crazy. The process of writing music typically takes between three and five days. Then it goes to my orchestrators who translate what I've done into notation, to scores and parts that can be read by musicians. This is a process I actually used to do myself for the first three seasons of Battlestar, but by season four the schedule was so overwhelming that I just couldn't do it anymore. Now I work with an excellent orchestrator named Brandon Roberts. Brandon understands exactly how I write and is able to translate it perfectly to the page. For this episode, I asked my friend and mentor from college, Jim Hopkins, to come in and join us. Jim is himself a master composer and orchestrator and was really a major influence on the composer that I've become today. I asked Jim to come in and sit down with us and help us come up with some interesting textures and ideas for this score. Of course, this is a, it's a long cue and it's fast and it has to sustain the momentum. So part of the problem, or part of the concern, is, is to create variety within unity and to keep things going. And I think at the compositional level, Bear certainly did that. But at the orchestrational level, to be able to introduce some sorts of variety and yet still obviously have it the same cue, I think there's some really imaginative touches in here. And I would send Jim stuff, um, and I would send Bear stuff. Then I get comments from both of them, and Jim and I would talk on the phone, and basically it was like getting a orchestration lesson. What? There's no challenges. It's like automatic. They just they just look at my ideas, and it's like it's done. I mean, that, there's nothing else to it, right? Yeah, nothing nothing all that, that you hear about. You're yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what it seems like to me. It just practically orchestrates itself. A lot of television scores today don't use any live musicians at all, and it's something that I really miss. I felt very strongly when I got Battlestar Galactica that I wanted the intimacy and passion in the music that only live musicians can bring. It really holds up as a piece of music instead of something that, that you would say, oh, that was TV in the 80s. That sounds like um, something that somebody wrote with this and this sample library that's available from iTunes, you know? It, it's, it's much more a piece of music that 
um, hopefully we'll be able to listen to and enjoy it for a long time. We have a unique process for recording live musicians on Battlestar. We record in multiple sessions. We don't ever record all the musicians in one room at the same time. This is mainly because the ethnic instruments are so unusual, so unpredictable, so hard to keep in tune, that it doesn't make sense to record them all together. So we, in fact, are recording percussion at one studio, while we're recording Duduk and violin at a different studio, all while I'm at the scoring stage conducting the string orchestra. This is something that's actually born of necessity, because most of the time, the entire recording process has to be finished in only two or three days. One of the most exciting parts of the score to A Disquiet Follows My Soul is that it gave me an opportunity to work with an orchestra, which is something that doesn't happen on every episode of Battlestar. Every time we get to do orchestra is a treat on Battlestar. Every time you hear the strings, I want it to stand out. Every time there's an orchestral element, I want it to be special, um, which is tricky because we're using it more and more often, so it's put a lot of pressure on me to keep the sound changing and keeping it interesting. The way he set up the group on this particular, for this entire recording session, but especially for this cue, it's very unorthodox. So he's got um, no violas at all. He's got um, first and second violins split left and right, which is not that common. And then he's basically put the brunt of everything, um, all of the movement and everything in the cellos, um, the three sets of cellos and the bass. And so what it did is it, it basically made it so that we could completely get rid of all um, traditional ways of orchestrating and we could approach this you know, freshly and say, what, how can we make this sound really cool? Because ultimately the scene is about her, she's feeling this burst of energy and that's what the strings are providing, but it's not really real. It's, it's I want to create a sense of, an ominous sense that goes along with this energy, that she's feeling this energy, but in a way she's just burning the candle faster. In the absence of the violas, there are 10 cellos and a total of 12 violins. It would seem on the surface that it's a very bottom heavy sound, but in fact, because the cellos have such a huge range, that uh, the way they're used, I think, really provides a more colorful ensemble. Yeah. things I count on my music team for is to serve as an extra set of ears in the booth. When I'm out there conducting, it can be hard to hear every out of tune note, every little mistake, so I really count on my guys to catch these little things that might get by me. Lovely, let's take a 10. But do you think um, they're playing is too strong, like it gets too funky almost? Yeah, you want to. I mean, maybe if they maybe they play it legato like da 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 da. da or just not bounce off this note so much. Like maybe it's they're they're getting not don't bounce off of the second eighth notes. Yeah. And that might help. Ten for twelve. Here we go. One of the most important soloists on the series is Chris Bleth. He plays basically every woodwind instrument you can imagine, but the most important I think is the duduk, which he plays on every episode of the series. Uh, I'm Steve, Steve Kaplan, I'm Bears engineer and co-producer, and we're recording Chris Blath, the Duduk and multi-instrumentalist. Duduk is an Armenian instrument. It's a diatonic instrument, so it takes a lot of work to get it to fit in with the A440, the way we work with samples and with live players in, uh, in Hollywood here, where everything's got to be in tune and stuff. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work to make it do this for Bear. <laughs> And he definitely pushes it. The Bansuri is, it's a transverse, very basic six hole flute with no keys. I've basically written for every instrument that Chris Bleth owns. And the same can definitely be said for M.B. Gordy, the percussionist on the series. We have here the three most important elements of any recording session. One, the scores. This is all the music that we're going to be recording. Two is the master chart, which is basically the Bible of everything we're going to be recording. And we use a, a very, um, very special method to, uh, to make sure we get everything recorded, which is check it off with a pencil. And the third thing is mitts, so that everyone in this vicinity has fresh breath at all times. So the way we're actually record a lot of this stuff is 
um, a little bit unorthodox. Instead of going through each cue and doing all of the percussion instruments for each cue, we actually will record all of the same instrument and straight down the list. So MB will in there, be in there hitting taiko drums, taiko drums, next cue, taiko drums. Then we'll actually reset up and he'll start doing rims, the clack, clack, clack part. That way we're actually able to to spend less time on mic setups and a lot more time on just dealing with the music and making it sound good. MB lays down a huge arsenal of percussion instruments, but none is as important to the soul of Battlestar Galactica as the taiko drum. Taiko drums have been around the world for a, thousands of years. Um, and if you go to Japan, you go to some of these temples, you'll see the big, these huge taiko drums made out of a one tree trunk. These are the nagados, the bigger ones. There's, a, there's shimes, there's hiradaikos, so there's, there's a all different, a vast array of sizes of drums and they each have a different name, so. It really feels like a percussion orchestra because uh, he lays down drums in every register. And so it fills out the whole texture. There's drums at every level and it creates a very, very full percussion sound. Another really important musician to the Battlestar Galactica sound is Paul Cartwright. Uh, anytime you hear the Rosalind and Adama theme, it's usually him playing it on the acoustic fiddle. So he's in this cue playing the melody tucked behind the orchestral strings. That was one of the first uh, recurring themes that Bear had me play acoustic violin on, and uh, it's come up a number of times since then. And it's one of my favorites in the show. Once the recording process is finished, the tracks have to be mixed together. And this is where my mixing engineer and co-producer Steve Kaplan really gets to shine. Steve and I have been working together for over 10 years, and he's really an integral part of the Battlestar Galactica sound. Here we are mixing uh, Roslyn running. This is kind of the final stage of what we do with all of Bear's cues. Everything you've seen up to date gets reassembled into this one system so that we can hear everything together and try to make it sound good. We take all those millions of tracks and make them into two tracks. This cue has 173 audio tracks, and that's after I've already broken it down a bit. It just kind of goes and goes and goes and goes. We get basic balances. For example, now it's the gamelons, just to try to get them to sit in just the right place so they're not too distracting, yet also still interesting. So we have to get the gamelons to fit inside of the strings, because the strings are the guys that are doing the melody, and that's, you know, what people want to hear. And you got to get them in there so that it's just right. Otherwise, you're going to have no room for the taikos and no room for anything else that we recorded, including the soloists. But at this same time, we have a Paul Cartwright solo going on that has to fit in with the strings as well. And still, at this same point, we're looking at a bunch of percussion as well. We have our taikos, and even more taikos, and, and more taikos. And then we have the little taikos. And those all have to fit together as well within the concept of the rest of it. So all of this stuff has to go on. And so we have to kind of trim everything piece by piece so that at the end, it doesn't feel like this huge zoo of stuff. And so most of my job is to prioritize what I think Bear wants to hear and to create some sort of soundscape so that the textures stay textural, yet still relatively present, and then the melodies are still big enough that we can hear um, the ideas and the motives and the theme. Once Steve's mixes are finished and I've had a chance to approve them, we send the finished score off to the dub stage, but we don't send it as just a final mix, we split it out into what we call mix stems. And so you have a five-channel surround of the percussion, and you have a five-channel surround of the orchestra. And if you put them exactly at the same volume, you get my mix. And so that allows them on the dub stage to take my mix, what I last heard, start from there. And if they need to change it for dialogue or sound effects, they at least have a starting position instead of having to remix the whole cue. It's not until you bring it into the mix stage and combine it with all the backgrounds and foley and dialogue, and sometimes maybe the you know, the, uh, uh, the pitch of someone's voice uh, maybe doesn't react well with the music. It's, it's, it's hard to anticipate all this until you put it all up together. Sometimes we find that certain things get in the way. Perhaps a drum is confusing us with uh, some gunfire in a ship battle or something like that. And so we might go in and do a little microsurgery or just mute one of the voices or one of the splits in the queue 
and try to preserve as much of the queue as possible. Giving them that many tracks gives them the ability to mute certain elements and keep the rest of the mix the same. And what we hope is to preserve, you know, the melody and counter melody and uh, the percussion and everything else that Bear has going for it. Uh, but try to eliminate maybe something that's getting in our way. At the end of all this, the producers finally have the chance to watch the final episode with the complete music. And at that point, the episode is truly finished. Usually the next day, I will get up in the morning and start working on the next episode and go through the entire process again. Um, as you can see, it's kind of complex. It's not as simple as just downloading the music out of my brain, as much fun as that would be. No, it really takes a really talented music team to come together and make all this happen. It takes a tremendous amount of work um, to make every single cue come together. Steve, are we all smiles back there? Yeah. Yeah. Good. 413, 3M14.